Okay. Well, it looks like um, the entrance of people is kind of slowed down, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to our climate training workshop. We wanted to have this so we could emphasize different ways brownfield reuse and remediation can support building climate resilience and highlight ways climate issues can be incorporated into planning. Uh, I'm Jenny from the R9 Brownfields program, and I really wanted to thank the other R9 presenters you'll meet shortly who put this together and give special thanks to our guest speakers who will introduce themselves later and go over some wildfire and sea level rise case studies, as well as ICF, a longstanding partner of the Brownfields and Land Revitalization Program who provide expertise and support in technical assistance projects all over the country. Uh, so, Brenda, if you want to get started. Sure. Thanks so much for that introduction, Jenny. So diving in and what we're going to cover today in a little bit more detail, what we're trying to accomplish in our two hours together is to increase your understanding of regional climate risks to contaminated sites and communities at large. So what is happening and how does that affect brownfields? Then jumping into what are the solutions? What do I do about that information once I understand it? So that's everything, as was just said, from planning efforts to revitalization and redevelopment, sort of that full continuum of options available. And then we want to empower you so that when you go home after this training, you know how to find even more detailed information for a specific location, whether that's a community or a site that you're working on. And so we want to point you towards and teach you how to use some resources and tools so that you can do those deeper dives on your own. And that's basically broken down into this intro section, a little bit of just background right on why it's important to consider this. And then we're going to deep dive into a couple of specific hazards, wildfire, sea level rise, and inland flooding. And then we have some time for reflections and closing. Just quick housekeeping rules. Please do mute your microphone. I think we're pretty familiar with this protocol, but always a good reminder to check. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box at any time. We're happy to take those. If you're having any technical issues, you can put that into uh, the chat or directly email my coworker Fiona at fiona.price at icf.com. Just for your awareness, we are recording these sessions. And if you're more comfortable with Spanish, we have enabled closed captions in Spanish. If you want to access that feature, you can click the ellipses at the very top of your screen where it says more and then select language and speech and then the closed captions option. So now we're going to do some quick introductions. Um, Jenny already kicked us off so well, but Brooklyn and Daniel, if you want to introduce yourselves. Sure, I'll start. My name is Brooklyn James. I'm also on the Region 9 Brownfields team. Thank you all for coming today. Daniel? Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Moore. I'm also with the Region 9 Brownfields team. Thank you for joining. And as Jenny said, we have some great case study speakers lined up. So Jason, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi there, I'm Jason Muir. I'm a civil engineer and um, I work for Geocon and help the city of Grass Valley with Brownfields projects. Okay. Amy? Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Wolfson. I'm the city planner for the city of Grass Valley. And David? Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm David Froelich, project manager with San Francisco Rec and Park Department and project manager for the India Basin Waterfront Park projects. Great. OK, and on the ICF side, you'll obviously be hearing from myself today. I'm a director of climate resilience at ICF. But you'll also be hearing from two of my colleagues, Kim Ermey and Emily Blanton. So a few more friendly faces today. And now we want to know who all of you are and who's participating today. So we've set up a mural exercise that we'd like you to participate in. Uh, sorry, not mural, Mentimeter. We're going to be using mural later, excuse me. 
Mentimeter is a very easy virtual online polling system. Um, you can go to www.menti, as you see in the bottom right of the screen there, and as it says in the chat, um, .com, and you can access it on your phone, on your laptop, computer, whatever is easiest for you. It will ask you for a code. You can see that on the bottom of the screen right now as well. And in the chat, the 36616677. And we'll be stepping through these two questions one at a time, um, just simply starting to ask you to state your organization and role. And then we'll move on to the second question of what you're hoping to take away from this training today. So we'll pull up what that is looking like as the answers roll in. And if you were still getting navigating to the website um, and are mad at me that the code has now disappeared, it's right at the top of the screen still where it has the web address and the use code. Um, great. To, it's fantastic to see so many people have signed on this morning and we're very excited to have you with us. Nice to see the mix of people from um, tribes to local municipalities to um, nonprofits and others that are participating in the training today. So thank you all for coming. Other consultants. This is a topic that we hope everyone is um, embracing and considering in their work. And it's great that we are bringing together such a diverse set of people for that conversation. But just one more minute on this question. All right, it looks like we've slowed down. Let's go on to the next one. So as I said, our next question for you is, what are you hoping to take away from this training? That helps us uh, navigate in real time to emphasize some topics more or less, as well as to understand if we're not hitting the mark, what maybe we need to include in some future trainings. What I'm seeing come in so far is a lot about understanding the risks, understanding the solutions, strengthening understanding of this work. Um, those are certainly all things you will be getting out of today. So that is fantastic. I hope I hope we are meeting your needs. And if not, we're also always open to ideas for future trainings.
think we're slowing down here as well. This will stay open, so feel free to keep typing if you're finishing up, but we'll switch back to the slide deck just to keep things moving here. So now moving into the importance of considering climate change. So there's many reasons why we want to be considering this, but obviously the very bottom line, right, is that climate change impacts pose a significant risk to brownfield sites. And therefore, we need to be considering those risks while going through the process of assessment, cleanup, and redevelopment in order to reduce those impacts and support community resilience, climate resilience, and all of the great co-benefits that come along with that, such as health benefits, economic benefits, reducing displacement impacts, um, and helping build and foster those more resilient communities. But in order to do that, the first thing you need to know is how to identify potential climate impacts at the individual site and across your community. And as I said, that's something we will be hopefully teaching you how to do through this training today. We don't like to dwell on the negative, but you may be asking, I have a lot of things on my plate. Is this just another thing? How important is this? And so we did want to just highlight the cost of inaction. What if you don't consider climate risk during redevelopment, revitalization and such? And so we wanted to point out that by not considering these risks, it's quite possible that the site will become costlier to finance and to ensure people are starting to look and ask questions about how you're considering climate risk during those processes. Also to maintain and sell as those climate impacts can lead to increased and repeated damages, right? So much so that over time, if, if not dealt with, it could lead to an increase in the abandonment and underuse of brownfield sites because of these risks, which obviously pose financial risk to the community as those sites are not contributing to property or utility taxes and other detrimental impacts. But the good news is that the benefits are really multifold. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of co-benefits to addressing these risks and investing in resilience. And that includes, I won't go through all of them on this slide right now, but that includes financial and economic benefits like increasing job opportunities. It includes environmental benefits such as increasing trees and vegetated community spaces. You might do that to help with flood and heat risks, but it obviously provides habitat and other community benefits. On the infrastructure side, considering these risks um, will reduce the amount of maintenance and repair costs over time. On the health side, by building in resilience into your site and climate adaptation measures, you can also help reduce or eliminate exposure to contamination. And on the community side, you can enhance neighborhood walkability, including improving public transportation. These things all really go hand in hand. And we want to make sure we pause and point out that vulnerable communities really experience these impacts in an even greater way than most of our communities. And those include people that are low income, tribal communities, smaller rural communities, communities of color, children, pregnant people and mothers, disabled people, elderly people, and people taking certain medications or suffering from chronic disease. For example, they might be particularly sensitive to high heat impacts. And for these communities, um, especially when they're living around brownfield sites, they're not just impacted by any one stressor. It's really about the cumulative and compounding impacts of things like the chemical stressors in the, at the site and in the community. Non-chemical stressors like the built environment, the safety, the social and cultural well-being, and the climate risks. When you take all of those together, it really compounds into those cumulative impacts. So investing in reducing the impacts of any one of these is really going to be beneficial and targeting all of them is what we're aiming to do. Okay, so how is the climate changing? 
just saw a chat asking for some of this, so that's great. On this slide, I just have a really quick 30,000 foot view, right? The primary hazards, climate change hazards that you hear people talk about the most often is increasing heavy precipitation events, which leads to significantly more flooding in our communities. The next is extreme heat waves and higher average temperatures, and we'll literally be diving into these in more detail. So hold tight, you'll get a lot more information, but that extreme heat waves and higher temperatures and uh, the third being continued sea level rise and increased coastal flooding. And then what does that mean in terms of brownfield? What are the site? What are the hazards that affect brownfield sites? So it's the ones that I just mentioned, plus wildfires, tropical cyclones, and drought, some of those more secondary hazards as we commonly refer to them. Oh, sorry. So the ones that are on the left-hand side here, wildfire, flooding, and sea level rise, as I mentioned in the agenda slide, those are the ones we're gonna be doing really deep dives into. Tropical cyclones, extreme heat, and drought, we're not going to be going through in as much detail today, but I do have a more detailed slide on each of them just to give you a bit of a foundation for future conversations. So for tropical cyclones, we all know that throughout Hawaii and the Pacific Islands, we experience these events on occasion. The good news is that they are expected to decrease in frequency, so how regularly they occur. However, when they do occur, they are expected, based on the best available science, to be more intense, basically, to have higher wind speeds, more rainfall, more storms, storm surge heights, things of that nature. So maybe uh, hard to know where exactly that lands us at the end of the day, but less frequent, but more intense when they do occur. And in terms of how that can affect brownfield sites and communities, tropical cyclones can cause damage to infrastructure because of all of that flooding associated with the storm surge and the rainfall, increase food and waterborne pathogens, reduce access to emergency services, and cause sometimes very significant losses of electricity. For extreme heat, I think a lot of us have experienced this in our lived lives that average annual temperatures are increasing. Summers are getting much hotter. Winters aren't quite as cold with the exception of your cold snaps, which of course still occur on occasion. The number of days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit are increasing. And relatedly, heat waves are increasing in length and frequency. And that's when people have the hardest time with heat. It's not when you have a single day that's very hot. It's when you have a lot of days in a row where it's not cooling off at night. Um, that's where people start to really struggle. And extreme heat is definitely worse in our urban areas due to the urban heat island effect. That basically means when you have a lot of pavement, when you have a lot of buildings, a lot of hardscape, that material all sort of absorbs heat and reflects it back out into the communities, much more so than if you have a more green setting where trees are helping provide shade, um, the ground can sort of help mitigate some of those issues. And so we all know as well that who lives in more of those urban settings, there is a higher population usually of disadvantaged communities and they're particularly vulnerable for the reasons I stated before to those urban heat island impacts. And so in the graphics here, what you're seeing in the more red version in the middle is the average temperatures that are projected over the long term, um, the increase in temperatures. So your hottest days could be about two degrees hotter than they have been in the past. And while that doesn't sound like a huge amount, I think what we're trying to emphasize is that it is the, the um, it really just brings up those tail ends. The events that are hot today are gonna be even hotter and just getting worse. And then on the far right is more of an illustration of that urban heat island effect like I was talking about. Oahu was able to receive a grant to do some great citizen science, send people out with uh, thermometers essentially to measure the temperature around the urban areas of the island. And you can really see how much temperatures vary in different areas where they measured it on the exact same day, between about 90 degrees and 102 degrees in the most dense areas. So 
really just drives home that point that those really densely populated areas are much hotter than our more natural areas. And for drought, drought is projected to increase in frequency and severity in the Southwest and Hawaii. We've been seeing that over the last recent decade or so. And, but some islands like American Samoa uh, may see a decrease in drought. And what we're also expected to see is flash droughts. And that's where you have you know, those really high temperatures and lack of precipitation quickly impacting agricultural sites and things of that nature. But more so than just agricultural sites, that drought condition can impact vegetation at your brownfield sites. And obviously, we rely on vegetation at a lot of sites to help control erosion and reduce flooding. So that's something that you need to be considering with this potential increase. And so you can see on the map on the right there, the number of dry days, which aren't necessarily drought days, but are a good proxy by 2090 could be increasing compared to historical rates by 15 plus days in large swaths of this region. All right, so now we're going to change it over to Emily to take you through this next section of slides. Thanks, Brenda. So Brenda gave us a really great overview of some of the topics that we'll talk about in relation to climate. But now I want to get to the brownfield side of things. Um, so what does this all have to do with brownfields? Um, redevelopment in brownfields can play a super important role in increasing community resilience to the impacts that Brenda was just talking about. Um, it can be really critical to consider how those impacts are changing um, and how they impact your site right now to make sure that your brownfield cleanup remains protective in the long run. And finally, many of the brownfield sites that we work on are located close to EJ communities or other vulnerable populations um, that are experiencing some of those compounding factors that we discussed. And considering climate resiliency during the redevelopment process can also support resilience increases for, this, for these specific groups. So where do we go from here? Um, luckily, EPA has published a really handy manual that discusses um, this very topic. So the Climate Smart Brownfields Manual was published back in June of 2021 and walks through different techniques for incorporating climate into decisions throughout the redevelopment process from assessment and cleanup all the way through redevelopment. And there are two main goals of the manual that I'll point out. First, obviously, is to help the communities um, with brownfield sites consider the climate throughout their process, but also to provide a wide swath of references and tools for folks like yourselves and the larger brownfield community to use. So it's full of really great data. It's got a lot more information about why we should be considering climate as an aspect of brownfields redevelopment and case studies and examples. So please do go take a look at this manual after our training. Um, it'll be linked at the end and use it as a handy reference guide as you all work through your projects. So I won't go through the entire manual, but I do wanna give an overview of certain strategies at each stage of the Brownfields process so we can get a sense of how these two topics fit together. So the first one I'll talk about is planning. Um, as we all know, it sort of sets the stage for a really great redevelopment project. Um, and to make sure that your redevelopment is something that supports and benefits um, EJ communities or other folks that live around the site, it takes planning ahead. It takes the community engagement um, and understanding both demographics and socioeconomic contexts of the site. So many of these strategies you see here about building codes or incentives, um, should be reviewed and updated periodically by local and state partners. Um, so when you do get to redevelopment, the framework for climate smart buildings and climate smart sites um, is already established and expected as an outcome by the community. So some of these redevelopment planning activities also, such as market, market analyses and revitalization plans um, are eligible activities under your assessment grants. So do talk with your project officer um, to how to utilize uh, grant funding for some of these activities. So the next stage is maybe where we all get a little bit more comfortable with the Brownfields process, but when it comes to assessing a site. So, Obviously, phase one and phase two are a very important step in any of these projects, 
but important to note that these can be oriented towards climate. So, for example, when you include the investigation of a site history in a phase one or phase two, this can also include um, an investigation of the site's vulnerabilities to climate events that have happened um, currently at the site, what has happened in the past, and then how are those trends changing um, or intensifying at the site going forward. Um, and I think Christina will touch on ABCA requirements in a moment, but if an ABCA or an analysis of brownfield cleanup alternatives is necessary for your site, um, this is also a really great opportunity to weave in climate resilience as you evaluate different remedial actions um, in that ABCA. And so, for example, if there's an increased risk of flooding on the site that may compromise long-term effectiveness of a cap or other controls, um, that's something that should be balanced or taken into account when you're comparing remediation options um, for your site. So the next one that we'll talk through is demolition. Um, and of course, this is not necessary on all of our brownfield sites, um, but it can play a big role in a project. And so the strategies you see on here are really about mitigating or lessening impacts from demolition um, sites rather than adaptation. Obviously, we're getting rid of a building or a structure here rather than adapting it. But either way, um, demolition can result in a ton of landfill debris. We use a lot of heavy equipment that release greenhouse gases and have other community impacts um, during the process. And so deconstruction is an alternative that's described in the manual um, as an opportunity to divert some of that waste away from landfills. Um, and there are other existing programs and tools that are called out um, that provide examples of demolition programs. So if demolition is relevant for your site, and again, it's not always the case, um, talk to your Brownfield project officer to figure out um, how, uh, if grant funding is applicable for this, there are some cases where it is and some cases where it's not. So talk to your project officer um, if this is relevant for your site. So the next one is cleanup, another familiar part of any redevelopment process. Um, the EPA, uh, ATSM, and other organizations have produced several documents about how to um, implement greener cleanup processes on sites, but these strategies really focus on reducing environmental impacts by limiting the amount of contamination that is removed from the site or moved off site reducing waste generation and materials that are used on site, um, and also re using renewable energy to power some of those remediation um, activities and others. So greener cleanups um, has been a priority of EPA for several years now, so there's great resources um, online, and we've linked some additional ones at the end of this um, PowerPoint as well. And finally, which is my favorite part and where it gets really fun for communities is the redevelopment stage. So um, these are our opportunities or strategies to include climate that seem a little bit more obvious or things that you may already recognize as climate friendly um, development, such as green infrastructure or um, renewable energy development on a site and other strategies like multimodal transportation, so increasing the um, the ways that people access your site by bike or including a bus stop um, may be less obvious, but those also contribute to having a cleaner and greener site um, just by changing the way that people access um, the site. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christina and she'll provide a few comments from headquarters. Thanks, Emily. Hi everyone, I'm Christina Barnes and I work in the Office of Brownfields and Land Revitalization in DC. And I wanted to take a minute to highlight a few places where we are either asking our Brownfields grant applicants or requiring our current grantees to consider changing climate conditions. So we know that changing climate conditions can potentially impact the effectiveness of a Brownfield cleanup remedy as well as result in lost investments or abandoned projects if climate is not factored into vulnerable location reuse plans. So this past application cycle in the FY24 multipurpose assessment and cleanup grants, 
we added a new sub criterion to our grant guidelines um, and we asked applicants to describe and they will be evaluated on the extent to which their proposed project will improve local climate adaptation slash mitigation capacity and resilience to protect residents and community investments. So we're specifically looking for applicants to provide examples on how their proposed project will address climate vulnerabilities. And then, like Emily said, um, the second thing I wanted to mention is the ABCA since fiscal year 2013 to ensure that our cleanups remain effective, even as the climate changes, we added a term and condition to our grants that requires recipients to evaluate the resilience of the remedial options in light of reasonably foreseeable changing climate conditions in the analysis of brownfield cleanup alternatives or the ABCA. So that wording has changed a little bit over the years. Um, it says something slightly different on the screen here. And what's on the screen is from our FY23 terms and conditions. But the point is, is that we want to maximize the effectiveness of our cleanup remedies to protect public health and the, and the environment. So in order to do that, we have to take into account the changing climate. And um, as Bren Brenda mentioned earlier, um, we want to emphasize that brownfield revitalization is an opportunity for communities to become more resilient to changing climate impacts. So um, from there, I'm going to hand it over to Kim, who's going to dive into wildfire as a climate risk. Thanks, Christina. Um, so yeah, so we'll be diving into wildfire, which, you know, as we know, Region 9 is very prone to as a as a hazard um, and we'll do a deep dive into the impact and also hear from some case study speakers about how to incorporate resilience related to this. So as we know in this region, wildfires are becoming more frequent due to climate change uh, with longer seasons and larger burned areas and we'll get into why that is in a second. Um, but essentially this is projected to get worse and for the Southwest in particular, um, it's projected that the extreme wildfire season will lengthen by up to over 20 days. Um, and if you can see this figure on the right, that um, it's basically basically showing that projected change under the assumption of a high emission scenario compared to the historical baseline. And, um, you know, it varies across the region, but essentially most areas will see an increase again in, in the number of fire danger days, which is characterized by low fuel, fuel moisture. So moving on into um, what this means for brownfield sites and how it affects them. Well, the risks of concern include reduced air and water quality, given that a wildfire at a brownfield site can spread untreated toxins into the air and water. And that, of course, can pose pretty serious health risks to both the local and surrounding communities. And depending on the severity, wildfires can also significantly damage buildings and other critical infrastructure. And depending on which structures the wildfires affect, it can also create new brownfield sites. So if it destroys a property like a gas station or any other sites that have contaminants on them. And moving into what contributes to wildfire, um, we'll go into these in a little detail, but the main Contributors are increased temperatures, drying conditions, and then also the expansion of development into areas that are wildfire prone. So to dig into this a little more, um, so climate change has caused you know inc average and ex extreme temperatures to increase, and so we're seeing that paired with longer and more severe dry conditions as well that creates more fuel for wildfires, and related to that. We're seeing reductions in snowpack and summer precipitation, but, you know, again, kind of contributing to the, the increased dryness. And over time, we're seeing that the annual area burned has increased. So in the West, since the mid 80s, this has increased eightfold. And you can see in this figure on the right that that affects the vegetation in the area going. You can see we're going more from forested areas to more shrubland and grassland. And again, as I mentioned, when human infrastructure in an area can exacerbate that risk given that you know some fires there are caused naturally by lightning but others can be caused by electrical transmission lines for example 
So getting more into that development point, um, the wildland urban interface, also called WUI for short, um, is this term to describe that transition zone between undeveloped land and developed land. And every year it grows by about 2 million acres um, across the country. And between 2002 and 2016, over 3,000 structures per year were lost to wildfires in that region specifically. So with increasing development in that zone, that obviously increases the impacts from wildfire. And in the Southwest specifically, that population or that number of homes in the WUI has risen fast, faster compared to other parts of the country. So this figure on the right here is showing that there's kind of a range of housing in the zone that ranging from 30 to 60 percent of all housing is within that wildland urban interface. And so there are actions you can certainly do while redeveloping a site in that area to help reduce wildfire risk. And we're going to hear that later on. And we'll also hear um, about that through the case study before our first interactive activity. So now that I've covered wildfire risk and how it's growing and what that means, I'm going to talk to you through and demonstrate three different tools that can help you assess wildfire risk and conditions um, in your region and maybe even for a specific site. So to start off, we're going to start with CalAdapt, which is obviously it's very specific to California, but um, basically it's it's a tool that explores peer-reviewed data to portray how climate change might affect California at the state and local levels. So I'm going to switch to sharing my browser so we can go through this. So this is the CalAdapt website, and if you scroll down here, there's a couple different tools within it, but for this section, for the purposes of it, we're going to focus on the wildfire tool. So when you're here, um, it's a mapping tool, so you sc scroll down and see this map. You can also see it in a chart version. You can toggle it up here. Going back to the map, um, on the right-hand side here, you can select a couple different options that will affect what's shown. So for example, there's two different indicators. One is showing the probability of the area within one of these gridded cells that will burn. Um, this other one will show the probability that one of the grid cells will have one or more wildfires within you know, the next decade. And if you click these information buttons, you can see more and what that means. You can select the scenario. So these are, you know, obviously assumptions based on the emissions that we'll be seeing into the future. So you can pick a more um, less conservative or more, more conservative scenario based on what you are assuming. And then you can also select the simulation frequency. So either uh, by the year or by the month, and you can select which month you want to see it for. And then down here, you can select different um, models and also learn more about them here. So a couple options you can change here to affect the results. You can zoom in to the map, but it's pretty, it's not as granular, but I think you can download the data to see any more granular than what it's showing you here. And then also below the map, you can select the time range. So for example, if you want to see what it will be for the you know 2020 to 2029 range, you can slide your cursor over. It's giving me a little bit right now. But yeah, so you'll see how it changes through time. Then yeah. if you keep scrolling down, you can look at the data sources and even go to these links to download the data, like I mentioned. So again, this is very specific to California, but this is CalAdapt. Um, I'll now take us through another tool called Climate Mapper, which is for the entire US. Um, it's part of actually a suite of tools within this climate toolbox. So I'm going to launch it here. It's yet another mapping tool, again, broader than California, obviously. Um, it has data that is historical, near term forecasts, and future looking with climate projections. So there's a couple different um, impact areas with mostly focusing on hydrology and, and fire danger and drought. So we're going to click fire danger to look at wildfire. We're also going to, just for the purposes of seeing the projections, we'll click the future. With the variables, um, you can select a couple of different ones. I'm sorry, I went back to climate. So I'm going to change it to, again, fire danger is the impact area. And then the metrics or variables within, you can choose, we'll do extreme fire danger for this one. Um, and you can, on here on the map, you can zoom in, zoom out. You can click on a specific area 
and it can show you whatever you know metric that you've chosen. So in this case, it's the extreme fire danger days. You can choose different time periods. Um, you can choose different scenarios. So with these, it'll show you the exact value of the days based on these submission scenarios or here, like that figure I showed earlier, it'll show you the comparison. So if we choose this one, it'll show that, you know, in this particular area, it'll be an increase in 4.6 days from the baseline in these extreme fire danger days. Um, you can also, you know, take screenshots of the map to download it, but if you want to download the raw data, you can scroll down to this tab and download, you know, the raster data to upload to your own mapping softwares. And then you can also share whatever, whatever view that you've gone to, you can share that layer here too. So this is Climate Mapper, very useful tool to look at things wildfire and beyond based on you know, what you can play around with here. And again, it is, it is nice that it has past near-term forecasts and future as well. So I'll move on to the third tool, which is um, the Na FEMA's National Risk Index. So unlike the other two that I showed, this one is um, based on forecasts as opposed, or sorry, based on his average, an average of past events as opposed to projections. So it's not as forward looking, but it's still useful to see, you know, near term and relative risk. So there's 18 different hazards that you can view here, but we're going to go to again wildfire since we're in this section. Um, what it does is it shows this risk index that is a function of expected annual loss, social vulnerability, and community resilience. And you can click between these tabs here at the top just to see that isolated you know, component data. But to navigate to where you want to go, you could obviously zoom in on the map, but um, I'm going to spotlight Hawaii here for a second. Um, and so once you zoom in, you can navigate between a county view or a census tract view. So you'll see the different census tracts here. Um, if you click on one, a report will come up here on the right that shows you the details about that risk index. Um, and you can create a report to download that data. You can also, you click here, you can also compare it. You can per compare census tracts or counties to each other. So it's a useful tool to get a sense of just this high level risk of wildfire. I'll back it out of this one. Um, and then I believe that's it. And you can also click here to do a more in-depth search of, of data because it pulls to a different tab. All right, I think, so those are the three tools. That are, they'll be linked at the end of the slides and you'll have access to them later, but they're pretty relatively user-friendly and a good idea to get um, a sense of wildfire risk or conditions at your site. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it back over to now to um, Jason and Amy, who will talk through the, a case study of wildfire in Grass Valley. Thank you, Kim. Um, yeah, I'm going to just provide a brief introduction and then uh, Jason will take the bulk of it. Um, but uh, my name is Amy Wolfson, I'm city planner of Grass Valley. Grass Valley is a rural Northern California foothill community situated between uh, California's Central Valley and the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Um, most of our city is located in a very high wildfire severity zone, um, and our late summers are often uh, plagued with uh, fire evacuations or unhealthy smoke levels. In my nearly 20 years of living here, that trend has seemed to increase in frequency, and uh, that can likely be attributed to the effects of climate change. Our city has a rich gold mining legacy, um, hosting one of the richest gold mines mining districts in the state. Uh, while our mining history is what um, could be attributed to what put us on the map, uh, the mining was completed virtually with no environmental oversight, and that's left us with some problematic contamination issues that persist to the present day. Uh, in addition to the health hazards posed by contaminated soils, neglect of contaminated sites that are perceived to have low land use value often leads to lack of land stewardship and proliferation of vegetative fuel sources that can exacerbate, exacerbate uh, fire conditions. Um, and so from here, I'm just going to um, uh, introduce you to Jason Muir. Uh, he's senior en engineer with the city's consulting partner, Geocon, and he can provide a little more detail on the city's mining legacy and contamination issues and how remediated soil conditions can help lessen the risk of wildfire in our community. Thank you, Amy. 
I'm Jason Muir. I'm a civil engineer and I live in Grass Valley and I've been working with the city for years on brownfield cleanup. Um, as Amy mentioned, we're in the Sierra Nevada foothills. Um, we're an hour up the hill from Sacramento and if you keep driving another hour, you're at Lake Tahoe. So we're right in the middle of gold country. And from 1850 to 1950, our economy was based on mining and timber harvesting. But those economic pillars are no longer supporting our community. And many of our contaminated sites, our, our brownfield sites, are abandoned mines. So I'm going to talk about how mine cleanup and wildfire mitigation go together in Grass Valley. Um, a lot of our work is done through uh, a uh, US EPA community wide grant and um, Amy is the project manager. Scott Stolman is our project officer. We work with uh, a couple of different units that did the DTSC to get cleanup plans approved. Um, I'm the technical manager and then. I'm sorry, community outreach. Uh, our study area is in the southern part of Grass Valley. It's called the South Auburn Street Corridor. And the reason we picked this location is because it has a fairly high Enviro screen percentile. Um, it's got a lot of cleanup sites. Uh, it's economically challenged. And uh, also the census area uh, is uh, a qualified opportunity zone. So zooming in on that on that census tract, um, this is South Auburn Street down here, and all of these red outlines are sites that have been or are uh, are still being assessed and cleaned up for uh, mine contamination. And zooming in more on our study area, you can see all of our sites here um, are um, they're 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 not the actual mines, but they're impacted by the big mining complexes. This is the Empire Mine, which is now a state historic park. Uh, this is the North Star Mine. And we get alluvial transport and um, aerial deposition and migration of contaminants onto these sites that prevent their development. So most of the mine cleanup that we do is for uh, uh, load gold mining, underground hard rock uh, mines. This is a typical head frame from back in the day. Um, and the, the shafts go down from the head frames several thousand feet. Underground, you have, um, as you can see in the picture on the right there, ore carts full of gold bearing ore. And that ore is hoisted out of the ground and then stamped in these huge stamp mills, um, uh, some of which are still around in the historical museums and then processed with mercury on amalgamation plates or later in the mining era, they were leached with cyanide. And then all of this mining waste that has heavy metals in it, plus the added mercury and cyanide are disposed to the ground surface. And as Amy mentioned, none of this was controlled. There was no environmental regulation at that time. And you can see all the logs in front of this head frame here. Those are timbers that were used underground to support the tunnels and the shafts and the stopes and to keep things from uh, from collapsing underground. So a lot of timber was used during the uh, the mining era. Here's our study area again. Um, this is a 1947 aerial photograph. So it's right at the at the tail end of the of the mining era. And looking at this old photo, you can see as I've highlighted in yellow here all of the tailings deposits. This is the uh, the sand dam area at the Empire Mine Historic Park on the right. And um, we have creeks running through these deposits that move the tailings around and deposit them on other sites. For instance, Little Wolf Creek runs through this uh, sand dam area and it deposited tailings on our Joyce Drive site, which is slated to be uh, Habitat for Humanity affordable, affordable Housing. And we're going after cleanup funding right now to clean to clean that site up so we can put it back to use. Um, this is infrastructure on top of all of the old mining features. The freeway came in in 1960. The shopping centers were built in the 80s and 90s. And so you can't really see 
the um, you, you know the mining impact from the ground surface necessarily. But back in the day, this is what it looked like. Here is the Champion Mine on Deer Creek, a few miles away from from the site I just mentioned. This is all mine tailings. This is a creek bed that's full of mine tailings. Um, here's the same site where the the tailings are spanning the whole uh, the, the whole creek channel. And the surface of the tailings is 30 feet higher than the actual creek bed. So that's tons and tons and millions of tons of tailings that, uh, as shown in this picture, got washed down into the delta. And that's what caused the environmental regulation and the outlawing of hydraulic mining and the requirement for uh, tailings impoundments. And, uh, you know, basically put an end to the unregu unregulated uh, mining era. But um, it's still in our community, and to assess it, we do historical research, we do subsurface investigation. Here's a, a exploratory trench in a tailings area. You can see a little bit of tailings exposed in the sidewall of the trench. It's basically just crushed ore that has elevated arsenic and lead and mercury in it. And these tailings deposits can be really deep. Um, this is a picture of a trench in a wetland area where we have 16,000 cubic yards of tailings that were washed down from the Empire Mine and deposited in this wetland. If you look at the ground surface on this site, it looks like this. And the, uh, the, the reason it looks like this is because we had a wildfire. The site wasn't able to be developed even though it has an approved uh, development plan, uh, but it's contaminated so no work can be done. Uh, it was unmaintained. It's an attractive area for homeless people, and it burned down. And we've had a lot of fires like this in our area because these sites are unmaintained. Nobody is taking care of them. Um, this is the cleanup plan for the site. We have a mixed use development with uh, uh, commercial here with mine waste encapsulated underneath it. We have residential and open space. We have a park here and then a, and an access road here, both with mine waste encapsulation. And so we're hoping to put this property back to use and uh, eliminate the, uh, the hazardous exposures, facilitate housing development, and, and then also mitigate wildfire risk by um, promoting stewardship. Another example is the North Star property just south of town. This is a 700 acre uh, mining complex. It's one of the biggest in the nation uh, from back in the day. Here's downtown Grass Valley. Here's our other site that we just spoke about, uh, South Auburn Street. And um, all of this area is too contaminated to build on. Um, there's no way we could do residential here. But the long-term plan is that we'd like to do a Brightfields project and eliminate wildfire risk, allow for renewable energy, um, that's a long ways in the works, but uh, you know that's a, a future plan. Um, just to talk a little bit about our regional wildfire history, uh, this map uh, is actually from Capital Public Radio, but it's based on um, CAL FIRE data. And these are all of the recorded wildfires in our area. Here's Sacramento, here's Lake Tahoe, Grass Valley is kind of in the middle here. Um, the fires are color coded based on date. Um, and you can see we're in the forest, the forest burns. Um, we need fuel reduction to uh, mitigate the risk here because it's only getting worse. Uh, locally, um, we've had a lot of fires in the last decade just in Grass Valley. This isn't uh, you know, the regional fires that everybody hears about, but, but these affect us right in town. We had the Bennett Street fire in 2015 and it burned up one of our sites. Uh, the Auburn Street fire in 2016 and burned up the site down in the in the um, study area that we were just looking at. And I think that year uh, we had to evacuate to Grandma's house um, because we had an evacuation for another regional fire in our neighborhood. Um, Dorsey fire in 2019, the Brunswick fire in 2021, and the Bennett fire also in 2021. That year, Grandma and Grandpa evacuated to our house, and um, it, you know it has everybody worried, and, and it's you know it's only going to get worse. Um, from a climate change standpoint, 
we've always had dry summers. We, we have the Mediterranean climate. We've had 250 dry days per year. And um, at least on the, the climate mapping, uh, the CMRA website, that doesn't change significantly in, in the models, but what we will see is hotter temperatures. Right now we have a month per year, or historically we had a month per year of temperatures over 90 degrees. Now we have what feels like considerably longer uh, of temperatures over 90 and 100 degrees. And then it's predicted by the late century, we're gonna have, uh, using the, the higher emissions model, um, 60 to 95 days per year of temperatures, you know, in the 90s and the 100s. And um, that that makes it really tough. Um, so my job and, and, and the city's intention with the Brownfields funding is to reduce toxic exposures by cleaning up line scarred land, to facilitate the redevelopment uh, of affordable housing. We have parks projects, commercial development, and then hopefully the uh, Bright Fields projects with solar energy, and also to reduce wildfire risk by promoting the land reuse and stewardship. And in our densely forested community, uh, I think brownfield cleanup and wildfire mitigation go hand in hand. And uh, with our housing shortages and the climate change that continues to happen, the need for both is increasing. And um, that's all I've got. And our contact information is there if anybody has questions later. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jason. And I think I really do want to point out one of the strategies that you talked about in sort of maintaining um, active maintenance, I would say, of vegetated sites and that being a really important adaptation strategy, especially regarding the wildfires risks. So we're going to switch um, one more slide before we get into a um, interactive portion. Um, and we just want to review some of the adaptation strategies specific to wildfires. Um, and these really focus on reducing the amount of um, flammable materials that are on your site and um, also reducing the, the distance essentially between the fuel and what you are trying to protect. So thinking about using fence lines or even the design of different uh, walking paths and that sort to break between flammable materials and what you would uh, protect in terms of um, buildings or um, and others. So as we're getting that back up, um, oh, here it is, perfect. So as I said, sort of reducing the amount of flammable fuels that are on the site. Um, Jason talked about a good example of thinning out some of the existing vegetation and establishing that regular maintenance pattern um, but also thinking about using non-combustible materials, and I know several communities um, in California now have building codes that require a certain um, level of non-combustible material usage. Um, again, making sure that there's sufficient spacing between the flammable um, structures or flammable materials and your structure. Um, and the last one that I thought is interesting, especially something that you don't really consider very often, but using some sort of cover, whether it's uh, wire mesh or other sort of screening to prevent um, embers and other debris from wildfires impacting different um, different facilities. And so, um, especially when it comes to electrical or, or other um, systems. So with that, we're gonna jump into our very first activity. Um, we are using a whiteboard, an inter interactive online whiteboard called Mural. Um, and we've just dropped a link in the chat to the Mural board. You can enter as a guest. And um, this exercise is just an opportunity for us to, to talk about some of those adaptation strategies, look at a generic brownfield site, and start to think about how we could um, implement some of those strategies on this site. So as you're opening up the mural board, um, we'll go through a little bit of how to navigate. So you can zoom in or scroll in um, using your mouse. You can click and type directly into these sticky notes that you see around the photo. You can adjust the font size so you can see how large your font is on the screen, um, which is helpful for those following along. And if you see folks posting um, comments that you agree with or um, or you want to say kudos to that, you can use your checks at the top of the screen. You can just click and drag um, one of those down. So let's start populating our sticky notes. When you see this 
Brownfield site, obviously a former gas station. What are some of the wildfire adaptation strategies that you may think are appropriate for this site um, to increase its resilience? And think about some of the things that we just talked about both in the slides and, um, and in the case study. So I see some folks on here. Thanks so much for participating. Removing pavement if it's not needed, certainly in the redevelopment scheme, that's helpful. Also gets at the urban heat island, depending on where this property is. Eliminate the invasive weeds, certainly reducing the amount of flammable fuel um, on this site, it'd be important. Clean up the brush. Yes, the underground storage tanks, always a big question when we get into brownfield sites, but those would be removed, not necessarily a wildfire. Um, well, I suppose, yes, a wildfire risk, um, those do pose a, a safety risk. Yep, cleaning up more of the brush, vegetation management. Oh, I like this idea of reusing and recycling this structure. As a planner, I love to see some of that um, utilized again. Yep, see some other on the side. Active remediation definitely needs to be resilient. Great. Yep. Keep the existing fence. Yep. It's a good break between this road and what it looks like an open field. Awesome. Great job. All right. Yeah, installing break in natural materials, certainly. Backup power, yep. Yeah, so you guys have really touched on some of the key things that we've been talking about, and especially regarding the vegetation um, and sort of safety of remedial systems and that sort. So. Um, with that, please feel free to keep typing. I'll leave this up. We've got a few more um, opportunities to use the mural board later in the session, but I want to keep us rolling along. So, Amanda, if you want to switch back to the PowerPoint. And with that, I think Brenda will go through our next. Um, section regarding sea level rise and inland flooding. Yes, thank you, Emily. Let me just get to the right slide here. OK. So talking about sea level rise and inland flooding, what are the risks that these hazards pose to brownfield sites? They're both obviously primarily related to um, general flooding. We break it into inland versus coastal and sea level rise, but really we're just talking about flooding any areas. Obviously, um, this can have issues for our stormwater drainage. When your outfalls in your stormwater drainage are blocked by floodwaters or by higher sea levels, water can't get out. And so your water is going to pool on your site instead of effectively draining out to where you want it to. Floodwaters can obviously cause damage to buildings. We've all seen, hopefully not experienced, having buildings full of mud, mold, anything like that. It can damage critical infrastructure, like your mechanical and electrical equipment, um, your utilities, anything else that's on the site. And obviously the one that probably comes to mind first for most people, 
that those waters can spread debris and contaminants from the site to the community. So the inland flooding portion of that, why is this happening, right? What, what is the climate change nexus? And the nexus is really increased precipitation. What we've seen with some of these atmospheric rivers and other events of that nature, I know more are headed towards California as we speak, is that these extreme precipitation events are increasing in frequency and intensity due to climate change. And it is those extreme events that cause the very heavy flooding. And there's obviously also a nexus, as we have also seen in recent years, between wildfires and flooding, where after a wildfire burn, you're much more likely to have significant flooding issues, in part because there's a lot of debris that can be picked up and moved around that causes a lot of damage, and because fires make the ground very hard and dry, hydrophobic, and so you get a lot more water running off rather than being absorbed into the groundwater system. And so what else does climate change tell us? What are the more forward-looking projections tell us about precipitation patterns? And it is that they're becoming more variable. So when we do have rain, because a warmer atmosphere can hold more water, you get those heavy dumps, but we're seeing longer stretches with no rain in between those events. And that's why you're also seeing an increase in those drought conditions like I talked about earlier. But despite the aridity in the region generally, we think of this as a more desert type environment for large portions of the region. These extreme precipitation events are occurring and snowmelt conditions are also increasing the risk of flooding. And so on the right, what you see is the projected change in number of days per year with more than one inch of precipitation um, between now and the end of century under a high emissions scenario. So that one inch of precipitation is sort of a proxy for heavy rainfall events, right? And what you're seeing in those dark green areas is 30 days, over 30 days, um, more than there have been in the past of heavy rainfall, which is a very significant number. And changes from climate change aren't the only thing that's driving increases in flooding. It's also the increase in impervious surfaces in our communities. As we develop urban centers and infrastructure, we have more of these impervious surfaces, by which I mean roads, buildings, anything that's paved basically in one way or another, rather than being grass, natural habitat, trees, shrubs, things of that nature. And those natural habitats are really able to allow water to percolate down into the groundwater system to hold on like a sponge to that water. But when you replace that with roads and buildings, there's nowhere for that water to go. And so you get a lot more water um, piling up and causing those urban flooding issues. Now I'm gonna take you through a couple of pieces of information to understand FEMA's guidance and resources on how to consider um, flooding and future flood risks. So first off, there is a federal flood risk management standard commonly referred to as FFRMS that has been uh, changed over the years in various ways, but in its current iteration, it requires federally funded buildings and projects to consider future changes in precipitation and how that relates to flooding in project siting, design, and construction. And it asks that you do that in one of three ways. It doesn't tell you you have to do it in any one of these, but it gives you three options. The first is a climate informed science approach. And this is when you would be doing custom hydrologic and hydraulic uh, modeling to really understand the specifics at a given site. So it's much more technical and time intensive, but gives you really great information. You would probably need to bring in some external expertise maybe not everyone on this call, but most of us, to have something like that completed. The second two approaches are much more user-friendly. The first is the freeboard value approach. So basically on the FEMA maps, which I will be showing to you in a second, they state a base flood elevation. That is the expected elevation of water during a 100 year flood event. What this freeboard value approach asks you to do is for non-critical actions and infrastructure, you add two feet to that 
historical looking base flood elevation to help account for future changes in precipitation. For critical infrastructure, you had three feet. And that would be, for example, the steps up to the first floor of your building would get you to that elevation, or you would put your mechanical equipment on a platform above that um, elevation, things of that nature. So much simpler, it's definitely a proxy, probably less specific, might not fully address exactly what's going to be happening in the future, but gives you some good buffer. The third option is the 500 year floodplain. So on FEMA's maps, you can see and get information on both the 100 year floodplain and the 500 year floodplain in most locations. It's not 100% true, but in most locations. And so what they're saying is basically, if historically you have designed for the 100 year floodplain, change over to use the 500 year floodplain as a proxy for what the 100 year flood might look like in the future. So that's another way to start to understand this risk um, and address it that's relatively simplified, but a little, in my opinion, a little bit more refined than the freeboard value approach, since it is at least based on some local modeling. So I'm going to show you what those FEMA flood maps look like and how to access them through the FEMA flood map service center. But I want to give you a couple of caveats first. These are a great resource put out by the federal government. It's fantastic that they are available, but they put them out for the purposes of creating insurance maps. That is their um, why they're created in the first place. So they do have some limitations. First, they're not forward looking at this point in time. They only reflect past conditions. Second, they are not necessarily meant to provide a complete picture of flood risk. So for example, it's really only showing you coastal flooding and flooding along streams and rivers. It is not showing you that urban flooding that I talked about earlier caused by um, you know, water that doesn't have anywhere to go when it falls on all of our paved surfaces and things really causing a lot of that urban issues. So with that, I will switch over to accessing the FEMA flood maps. We'll put the link to this tool in the chat as well. Okay, so when you go to the FEMA flood map service center, you see a page that looks like this. There's a simple search bar here where you can enter an address, you can type in a city or coordinates, whatever information you have, and hit the search button. I've obviously already entered Reno, Nevada. The first thing you're going to see um, are some tools before you get to the map where you could print the map if you want to create an image. You can also download the image. Um, you can download some of the GIS files as well if you want access to that information. But the flood maps look like this. And if you're not zoomed in enough, you won't see anything other than the aerial background. So keep zooming in until you see something. They are not super intuitive to read, so I'm going to walk you through it. So if you see this pink and blue hatched area, that, as you can see on the legend, let me zoom out so you don't see the lines. Okay, is the regulatory floodway. So this is an area where you're not allowed to develop. It is preserved as floodlands. The blue area, as you can see here, is the 100 year floodplain. So those are areas you are allowed to develop in them, but you do obviously need to be cautious and take that into account. I would consider that to be of um, a high flood risk. I think we've all seen flood events are happening more regularly and the 100 year flood event can be a bit of a misnomer. It really means there's a 1% annual chance of occurrence, but that doesn't mean you can't have them three years in a row. And then the orange area is that 500 year floodplain that I talked about. And so that's a 0.2% annual chance of occurrence, a low to moderate flood risk. And if you zoom, and so obviously you can find your brownfield area. Uh, if you download the data, you could even create a GIS overlay to see is all or part or what elements of your site are within these various floodplains. But if you zoom in, 
this other information starts to pop up. And you start to see these lines. This one's labeled 4479, 4480, 4481. Those are the base flood elevations that I talked about. So they're in NAVD 88, which uh, the easiest way to think of that is feet above sea level. That's not 100% accurate, but pretty darn close in most locations. And so that's telling you if if you want to build in that um, floodplain, and let's say you were using the freeboard metric that the FFRMS suggested, then you were building right here. Instead of um, building to an elevation of 4,480 feet, it would be 4,483 for your critical infrastructure. And that might only mean, you know, three feet off of the ground level. So you have to check the elevation of the ground, but it's all relative to sea level. So that is the first tool. And then Amanda, can you pull up the PowerPoint again? So now I'm going to talk to you about sea level rise, the coastal side of this equation. We've seen the average rates of sea level have intensified since 1992. The map in the middle there is showing you historical trends in sea level rise around the country. Um, you can see that in most of, let's say, California, you're looking at about one to three inches of sea level rise historically. In Hawaii, it's up to four inches in some locations um, per decade. And sea level rise is projected to accelerate throughout the century. So those rates will be getting faster. You can see that in the charts on the right hand side. These are the sea level rise projections for Hawaii on the left and for Guam on the right. And what they're showing you basically is between now and 2100 what the potential amount of sea level rise could be. And so that's the zero to eight feet that's on the y-axis under different climate change projections. So as you can see, between now and about 2050, all of the scenarios are pretty closely grouped together. Um, but as you get out further in time, you're looking at a wider range of projections. I would say that both the low scenario and the high scenario are not super likely. I'd be looking more at that range of intermediate scenarios, probably focused around the intermediate scenario for planning purposes. So that would be the yellow line that's showing in 2100, about four feet of sea level rise in Hawaii and about three and a half feet in Guam. And sea level rise and the associated co coastal flooding can damage our coastal infrastructure. And it can also cause saltwater intrusion, which can cause corrosion, disruptions of our drinking water systems, and all types of issues. So why are we experiencing sea level rise? What is happening? As we, as a global society, increase global greenhouse gas emissions, it acts as a blanket on, uh, on the Earth that warms our atmosphere. And that warming atmosphere causes our polar ice melt uh, to occur at a faster rate, but it also causes thermal expansion of the water that's already in the oceans as those warm up. So those are the factors that contribute to global sea level rise. To understand local sea level rise, you need to combine that information with what's happening to your land locally. So for example, in the Gulf Coast, you're seeing a lot of land subsiding as you've pumped out groundwater, kind of like we've seen in the Central Valley, right? You get your land is actually um, yeah, subsiding, going down in elevation. In other areas, due to tectonic forces and things of that nature, you might be experiencing uplift. And so that's where the ground is getting higher, just through natural um, causes. So you have to look at the how the uh, sea level is rising and the ground is rising, and those can kind of counteract each other a little bit or vice versa. And the tool we're going to use to 
show you the sea level rise um, and allow you to explore that in your local area is the NOAA sea level rise viewer. There are many sea level rise um, mapping tools out there, so you can pick your favorite, but this is just the one I'll show you today. All right. We'll put the link in the chat. Once you get to the viewer, it will look like this and you can say get started. Uh oh. There we go. And you can enter an address or city at the top. I grew up in San Diego, so why don't we take a look there? And the way that I recommend using this tool is by going here to the local scenarios. In order to see that information, you need to pick one of these icons on the map. There's more of them as you go up the coast, but whatever the closest one is. And it will give you a version that looks like this. And so when you're in this view by scenario option, on the right hand side, you can toggle between those um, scenarios that I was showing you in those charts for Hawaii and Guam. You can say for the intermediate low scenario and what that populates, what you see moving as I move this layer is these numbers over here on the left. And what they're showing you is in feet, the water level, the amount of sea level rise basically for 2020, 2040, 2060, 2080, and 2100. And as you look at a higher scenario, the amount of sea level rise goes up. As you look at a lower scenario, the amount goes down. And in order to see that sea level rise actually populate onto the map, you need to move this blue mean MHHW button, which stands for mean higher high water, which basically means high tide. So let's say under the intermediate high scenario, I wanna see what conditions might be like in 2100. And so you can see that that started to fill in all of these blue areas in the map, which is areas where flooding would be projected to occur. The bright green areas are areas that if water had a pathway to get there, they would be flooded, but based on current development and things of that nature, there is no natural pathway. So fortunately for those areas, it's a defended area essentially. The other way you can explore this is viewing by year. And say you wanted to look at 2100, it basically just flips the view to say, okay, in 2100, the amount of sea level rise I could see is anywhere between two feet, where this would be the small amount of flooding, all the way up to 6.6 .6 feet, and that's the amount of flooding. So just two ways to look at the same type of information. Okay. So that is the tool. Get the slides back up here. And we're gonna switch it over um, so that David can talk about a great case study. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is David Froelich, and I am a project manager with San Francisco Rec and Park Capital and Planning Division. Uh, I am the project manager for the India Basin Shoreline Park Project. So India Basin is located, for those you who don't know, in the Bayview-Hunters Point neighborhood of San Francisco. It's near the former Navy shipyard at Hunters Point. Not to be confused with that site, it's a, a separate site, but just down the, the bay from it. Uh, the 900 in the site is a post-industrial brownfield that contained upland soils and in-water sediments with elevated concentrations of metals, uh, total petroleum hydrocarbons, PCBs, PAHs, uh, all which exceeded Title 22 hazardous waste levels as a result of former industrial uses such as boat building and vessel repair. So in the uh, late 1800s, schooner ships were all uh, built here. We have a historic um, shipwrights cottage on our site. Um, so that was the, the kind of home base for uh, building schooner ships, which transported goods in the, the late 1800s. 
The India Basin Waterfront Park project is uh, or consists of three phases. So the 900 NS remediation phase, uh, which was phase one and completed, uh, the 900 NS park phase, which is currently in construction, and that's basically building a park on that developed or remediated 900 NS site. Uh, and then finally, the India Basin Shoreline Park renovation project, which is the third and final phase of the project. Um, together, they'll combine with the India Basin open space across the way uh, to form one 10 acre waterfront park. Uh, it's also closing a gap in the, the SF Bay Trail, which is a trail that goes uh, around the bay. The property is also in the middle of uh, the one and a half mile long India Basin shoreline, which is comprised of seven properties along that area, uh, totaling 64 acres. Um, so a lot of future development happening around there. Uh, in, uh, India Basin Waterfront Park's Equitable Development Plan, or the EDP as we call it, was also created during the planning of this project. Uh, that uh, Equitable Development Plan ensures that this waterfront park will benefit current Bayview Hunters Point residents while preserving the culture and identity of the historic neighborhood. Uh, it basically provides a blueprint for delivering a park designed uh, by and for the community while improving economic opportunity and environmental health for its residents. Uh, it's a culmination of a two-year community-driven process to preserve the rich culture, identity, and pride within Bayview Hunters Point, which uh, is historically uh, a Black community, and to ensure that the multi-million dollar investment that we're putting into this project uh, helps transform the India Basin Waterfront project and, un and also uplifts the community beyond the park boundaries. There's a lot of information about this project uh, and uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to give a very high level overview of it. Uh, so as you can see um, on the this image on the left are the three phases. Um, phase one and two are the same site. Phase three is outlined. Uh, and then on the right uh, is the, the future park development. Uh, the project is uh, the project location is along the shoreline of the San Francisco Bay, as I mentioned, and is shown in the image on the left. Uh, it is within uh, future sea level rise uh, projections. Uh, our design team used the current and projected wave action water sea level water levels and tidal datums and settlement distribution analysis to help inform where we could develop shallower transitions in grade to create diverse habitat provide a natural edge that would be adapted to sea level rise, allow for a gradual transition of habitat up the slope as sea level does rise over time. Uh, these naturalized areas along the shoreline will also provide relief during larger storm events, minimizing the impacts of severe storms on the remaining park features. Uh, and so for this project, uh, the guidance that allowed us to set permanent features above the King tide level by the year 2100. So all of our buildings are above that level and all of our, our major um, uh, park features are above that, that sea level rise level. Uh, specifically for the 900 in a site, the overall cleanup and approach goals were to make it compatible with park and public use. Uh, to uh, remedy provide, the remedy provides a high level of health protection. Uh, it removed surface soil on land and sediments across the entire site uh, and replaced it with a clean fill material. And then um, that backfill prevents exposure to underlying native soils. The remediation project uh, for 900 Dennis was the first phase, as I mentioned. Uh, it removed and restored contaminated soils from depths about two to five feet that were left behind from industrial boat building and vessel repair activities. Uh, the targeted excavation removed two to five feet within uh, intertidal, subtidal, and on land, and it uh, basically placed an equivalent amount of backfill material to serve as a protected cover. Um, it also removed contaminated marine debris, abandoned structures, uh, deteriorated concrete piers and um, a variety of, of things that were left uh, behind uh, when Rec and Park purchased this site. Uh, and finally, the landmarked Shipwright Cottage, which is a San Francisco landmark, um, was preserved and abated of uh, hazardous building materials and is currently being restored during the 900 Park uh, 
development project that's in construction right now. Uh, it was a, a about a nine month uh, remediation schedule. It was uh, projected to be about seven million dollars. We went over uh, as as most projects do with um, some unforeseen uh, issues. Uh, and finally, we had three EPA grants that helped fund this project. We had uh, Brownfields grants for uh, parcels one and two, uh, Brownfields grants for parcels three A and three B, and then we had a um, SF Bay Water Quality uh, grant as well. Uh, and this 900 in a site is comprised of many different parcels, so that's why uh, there's there's multiple parcels and Brownfields grants for for different parcels. And finally, some fun pictures. So uh, these images show the remediation or the 900 in a site pre remediation. So a lot of of concrete um, and uh, marine debris and uh, failing and, and crumbling infrastructure was left behind when we purchased the property. Um, moving on, these site these uh, images are uh, before and during the remediation projects. So uh, the top left image you can see our contractor is installing a coffer dam that goes across uh, the basin uh, to basically hold the water back during the, the remediation project. Um, the bottom two images are, are during the remediation project. You can see how the water is held back. And then the uh, lighter area of backfill was uh, the area that was already um, excavated and filled in with clean backfill. A uh, couple images uh, after the remediation, um, just right before the top two are right before we took the water barrier down. So clean remediated site. The coffer dam is still in place, holding the bay back. Uh, the bottom left images of the historic shipwrights cottage that was abated uh, using one of our, our EPA grants. Uh, and then finally, the, the bottom image on the right is uh, after we remove the coffer dam uh, and finish the project, um, you can see a, a clean site. And I think the next image is a before and after. So before image on the left showing the 900 in this site um, with the concrete piers coming out. And then the after image on the right with the coffer dam uh, actually coming out during the, the when this photo was taken. So uh, you can see the bay was uh, coming back in and, and taking back over of that uh, 900 in a site. And then I'm going to leave you with uh, a rendering of what the park will look like once completed. Um, we're hoping to wrap up the 900 in this park uh, construction this uh, summer or late fall. And then after that, the India Basin Shoreline Park renovation, which is the site to the right with the big uh, pier coming down, will we'll start construction at the end of the year. And that's a two year construction uh, duration. So uh, sometime in 2027, this whole park will be open and and use used by the public. And that's all I have. Thank you. That's great, David. I just want to highlight something that you brought up during this case study that connects all the way back to why we should be thinking about climate in these brownfield redevelopment projects. But you mentioned, you know, the significant investment that goes into a park space like this, and considering how the climate's going to change, considering how sea level rise might impact this site means that you're thinking ahead to how these structures and investment will be protected in the long run to make sure that it's still, you know, a good investment for this site. So that's great. Um, and thanks for highlighting that. So once we move on to our next slide, we just want to go over some of those adaptation strategies that have been brought up during this um, section through uh, regarding flood impacts and um, storm impacts. And so what can we do on a brownfield site within the redevelopment context to better prepare for some of these impacts? Um, I think David made a great case for some of the nature-based solutions, thinking about how to widen some of those natural floodplains, protecting wetlands, creating additional habitat that um, can attenuate some of the impacts of storms um, and waves, obviously strengthening the shorelines. Um, preventing erosion. Um, and I want to touch on the last two, which are, are more um, unique or substantial investments in flood resiliency, but relocating certain elevation structure or relocating structures or elevating them out of the floodplain um, and also the use of floodable parks, which are a 
dual design technique where um, the recreational uh, facility, like a park, can actually hold and maintain water um, during a flood event and then let it um, slowly attenuate out to the storm drain system or um, evaporate over time. So it sort of serves both purposes. Um, and so thinking about these, we are going to hop back to our mural board and do our last um, workshop uh, exercise. So we've just dropped the link again. If you had navigated away from the mural site, the link to it is in the chat. Um, and we've got two sort of generic pictures of brownfields that you see on the screen. Um, and the top one obviously is experiencing pretty significant um, inland flooding. So around a um, gas station, you can see a car sort of driving through the water here. And then the second picture is a typical brownfield site um, on a coast. So again, we can use our stickies and drag them to the photo where you might implement a um, an adaptation strategy. So think about um, what these sites are experiencing and how we may improve those outcomes through redevelopment. Great, I see some folks on the mural. Awesome. Yeah, stormwater infrastructure is a big one. We often think about the built environment with gray water systems where we think of traditional stormwater, but thinking about the nature-based solutions that could um, main, or retain and then slowly release water back to a system could help us surf sort of the highs and lows of the water um, as it comes. So that's a great idea. Bioswales, certainly. Increasing um, capacity for stormwater, better drainage. Yeah, somebody mentioned reducing impervious services. That's a big one um, for me, or dealing with the increase in stormwater. Not always possible in right of ways, but think about how your site itself can um, use impervious services, perhaps for parking, or um, I've seen some interesting uses of impervious services on uh, recreational facilities like tennis courts and basketball courts. Hazard communication is a big deal. I'm so glad somebody put that on top of the car that is driving through water on this picture, right? Um, thinking about how we can communicate those hazards, certainly. Planting trees. Removal of abandoned gas stations to prevent contamination. Um, absolutely. We can think about how this um, may infiltrate and move some of that contamination off site. Green roof, yep. Raised walkways, absolutely. Somebody mentioned getting the railroad involved. Yes, if anybody has a great way to um, work hand in hand with railroads, let me know. This is great. So if we um, can zoom down and maybe Amanda, you could also summon people. Let's move to the second picture here where you see the coastal example. Um, and this is a different type of flooding event, right? Where we just talked about what happens on the coast versus inland. What are some opportunities for strategies to be implemented on a coastal site? We can talk through some of those. Yeah, possible soil removal. Certainly want to make sure that those contaminated soils are remediated or um, if they need to be removed off site and replaced with clean fill. Yep, nature based uh, shoreline solutions. Robust barriers, raising the grade. Yeah, certainly something to elevate any redevelopment that you have on this site is a good idea. Oh, I like the idea for an overlook. Yeah, I'm glad people are thinking about what structures are on the site already. How can these be reused? 
Oh, retention basin that doubles as a trail. That's a great idea. Drainage features. Absolutely, a great location for a natural buffer. I'm glad somebody noted that there are residential units um, somewhat nearby this site. So thinking about um, how this site itself could be used to um, increase resiliency for these neighbors is an important one. Greenway, yeah, that sounds great. All right. The other folks, this has been great. It's nice to see us sort of put these stickies or adaptation strategies that we've been talking about on a on a site and really consider where they may be implemented. Constructed wetlands, yeah, increasing that natural attenuation um, ability of the shoreline is also going to help. Channeling runoff, let's see. Absolutely, somebody noted being careful about not making flooding worse in other locations. And so I think it's important to think not only about how your site is handling water, but also how it may impact um, nearby sites as well. And so um, the best thing to do also obviously is to maintain the water on your site, um, but think about strategies to remove it as well. This is great. Amanda, why don't we flip over? Please feel free to keep typing. We're just gonna flip over to the PowerPoint. We've got some um, fun renderings that illustrate what these sites could look like on the flip side once they're redeveloped using some of these strategies that we've talked about during this training. I'll get down to that slide, but thinking about how these can be woven into the redevelopment process. So you can see our first example that was the inland flooding um, impacts on the left here. It's still raining, but you notice that the flooding is not occurring as much. You can see some of the bioswales and other green infrastructure that were incorporated on site, which somebody, lots of people noted. Um, the multimodal transportation, you love to see that. Um, yeah, reusing some of the structure. Um, great. And then on the right, you can see what the coastal situation may look like if it was redeveloped. Um, obviously, combining both the hard and soft shoreline, um, you could rip wrap um, these rock uh, wall as well to help with impacts of storms, but certainly increasing the floodable space on this site. Um, I really like to see people bringing this trail down to the waterfront so you have access to the water. Um, you can see some an example of a reuse of the actual building. Somebody mentioned that um, on the mural board. So yeah, just an, an example of what it could look like when you start putting all of these together on a site. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brenda to, um, to walk us through our last piece. Great, thanks Emily. So we're gonna go into our reflections and closing period. Um, first, we have a couple of questions for all of you and then we'll let you ask questions of us, but we're gonna use Mentimeter again. So again, the link is, um, we'll put it in the chat, but also in the bottom of this slide right now, menti.com, and you can type in that um, code 3661. 6677. That's also in the chat. And we're going to step through the three questions that you currently see on the screen. So if we can pull up the Menti page. So now the information with the link and the code is at the very top of the screen that Amanda's sharing. So feel free to grab it from there or from the chat. 
And our first question for you, you all came in with hopes and dreams of what you would get out of this, but what are you going to take away from this training? If you encounter a coworker at the end of the hall um, later today and they say, hey, you went to that training, what did you learn? Or what should we be doing? Um, what, what are you going to tell them? Less likely in the halls, but on chat these days. How to use mapping resources. That's great. And I saw some requests in the chat for the resources we shared today. We will be sharing out a one pager with all of the links and um, other access like that to the resources and tools we shared. So you'll have that cheat sheet moving forward. A reminder to include climate change components in reuse and planning. That's great. Good examples of how to do adaptation training. That there are climate change requirements in some of these grant applications now. That's a great takeaway. Broader solution of what strategies are available. appreciation for the case studies. I always love hearing those. Okay, it looks like we're slowing down on this one. Let's go to the next question. What adaptation strategies are you most excited to implement? So you did hear um, Emily cover a lot of example solutions you could consider. You saw our case study participants share how they are incorporating climate change adaptation into their um, redevelopment projects. So any particular strategies that yeah, you can already think of a site where you might want to apply it or you're just interested to talk to people about it more and keep it in the back of your mind. long-term planning for wildfire mitigation, green infrastructure. You love those options. This is a good point, but this is still a relatively new area of work. We all need to make sure that we're continuing to monitor the effectiveness of these solutions in order to help us build that business case for future sites. Need more adaptation strategies on mitigating the urban heat island effect. We have done other trainings on that, so we have plenty of resources we could point you to. Um, but yes, that was not a focus of today's session. Sharing community buy-in, that's a huge part of this. Even if you're excited, we can't just steamroll ahead with things without that buy-in. Right, let's move on to our third and last question here. 
what topics would you like to see future trainings on? So maybe it is urban heat island and general heat mitigation strategies, but what other topics uh, related to climate change and brownfields would you like more trainings on or fact sheets or other things? And if you can't think of anything right now, feel free to follow up with us later. We are always welcome to our ideas. Urban heat island, water conservation, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Jump right into some of the solutioning. Heat EJ ideas for funding, certainly something we can spend more time on. Okay, well, we appreciate all of your feedback here. We're going to leave this open, so feel free to keep it coming, but we have just a few more slides and a little bit more Q&A that we want to get through. All right, so we moved relatively quickly, but we do have about five to seven minutes here. If you have any questions for myself, any of the other presenters, um, or your fellow participants, feel free to put those in the chat. I'm sorry we didn't. We were trying to answer questions as they came in. Hopefully we got to most of you, if not all. But if you have more burning questions that you didn't ask earlier, feel free now. some thanks in the chat. Well, while people are thinking of questions, why don't we show the next couple slides real quick? So we did just want to point out that there are way more resources even than what we were able to cover today. Um, for example, there's many resources uh, from EPA on redevelopment, including many that are about topics that we were talking about today, right? Like the Climate Smart Brownfields Manual that Emily went through. Um, EPA's general climate adaptation website, resources on green infrastructure and smart growth and flood resilience and, um, you know, types of grant funding for those of you who are asking about the funding side. So lots of great resources there. And we will send this out afterwards as well. I'm seeing questions of uh, if the slide decks will be shared. Yes, those will are, this will be shared. And like I said, a one pager of resources version two. One more slide. And then where can you find more information on the risks side? So we have some overarching resources on this slide, like the fifth national climate assessment, which was just recently published and is really the go-to source for starting out um, and some of these mapping tools. There's also tools more specific to environmental justice that certainly needs to be a nexus with this topic. And then additional links to tools we covered and other tools that you could resource for wildfire, inland and coastal flooding, and extreme heat and drought. Next. There's also some uh, more specific resources for Hawaii and the Pacific Islands that we wanted to make sure that you were aware of and that we can share in more detail. And lastly, our thank you slide. So I'll turn it over to Jenny to close us out. I'm not seeing any other questions right now other than the ones we've already addressed. Hey, yeah. Um, if there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you all so much again for attending and caring so much about these issues. Like it, it really does just start from a place of concern. So 
Um, you'll probably all get emails in about a week with the follow-up materials. And in the meantime, or you know, any other time, uh, feel free to contact us at Region 9. Um, I think that's it. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>